we're in, we're in Matthew chapter 28, and we're, we're looking at the resurrection this morning. You know, I, buddy, I was kind of joking around. Um, I feel like, like if you're a pastor, this one of your jobs is to preach about Jesus' resurrection. You know, not not some inspiring talk about overcoming the you know the the challenges in your life, but to really get into who Jesus is, what He's doing, and how that changes absolutely everything. And so, so we're here to celebrate that this morning, but on the other hand, there are a lot of people out there that struggle with death, particularly in our community here um, in East Town, right? There are a lot of people that have grown up in the church and watched their parents get divorced and, you know, you know, watch people die around them. There are a lot of people in our community, right, that are very big into social justice and they look around the world and they see children stuck in child sex trafficking and they see people dying of starvation and people dying because they don't have clean water. Um, they see environmental challenges and they wonder, is God really alive? Is, is God really moving in the world? Does Jesus' resurrection really make a difference? And so in East Town, we have a lot of people in our community here that, that have given up on Christianity and walked away from the faith because, you know, Jesus really doesn't seem to be that alive and active. And, and when you look out at, at Jesus' church scattered around the city, and I'm not throwing stones or anything, they don't see a church that's alive and active and on the move with the mission of Jesus. And so, so people struggle with doubt. And uh, I want to give you a little quote from Jonathan Dotson. I thought this summed it up really well out of his little book, Raised, which I highly encourage you to grab, particularly if you know people in your life that are struggling with doubt and just trying to really reconcile the reality of the broken world that we live in with the realities that we're going to be talking about today in the resurrection. Dotson says this, he says, if you doubt the resurrection, I'm glad. Anything worth believing has to be worth questioning. But don't let your questions slip away unanswered. Don't reduce your doubts to a state of cynicism. Wrestle with your doubts. Find the answers. Don't settle for pat proofs and emotional experiences or, or dead religion. Keep asking questions. Question your faith and question your doubts. If Jesus really did defeat death, it changes absolutely everything. And so if we're going, we're going to, we're going to jump in this morning. We're going to wrestle with our doubts. We're going to kind of question some of those questions that we bring to the, bring to the table. We're going to challenge some of that skepticism that, that naturally comes to our heart. We're going to grapple with it through God's word. So, so let me read our text for this morning. It's Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to read it in its entirety. And then we're going to jump right in. And that's Page 542, if you're following along in our little ESP paperbacks. Again, Matthew 28, 1 through 20. I'm going to pray, and we're going to get underway uh, this morning. Now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know you see Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. They came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guards went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell the people his disciples came by night and stole away, stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. 
Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And then Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray as we, as we jump into our text this morning. Uh, Father, we promise that you would be with us even to the very end of the age. And so we know that you're here this morning, Father, to come and meet with us as we celebrate your resurrection from the dead, Father. But we're also aware as we gather together um, that there are people struggling to connect the reality of your resurrection with, with the challenges and the trials and the difficulties in their lives. And so uh, we pray, Father, that you would come just in your resurrection power, by the power of your spirit, God, and that you meet with us this morning. If, if you were disciples 2,000 years ago, if you're seeing you and your resurrection body doubted, Father, how much more do we need you to come and, and meet with us this morning and, and to come and speak to us through your word? And so I pray that you would come by the power of your spirit, speak your truth to your people, and I pray you'd help me to serve your people well this morning. Pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's my aim for this morning. If I can get one thing accomplished out of this text here in Matthew 28, it says, My aim is to show you that Jesus' resurrection demands a response. And if you're taking notes here, I've got three points for you. First of all, Jesus' disciples doubted his resurrection. Isn't that astounding? After seeing the risen Christ, Jesus' disciples doubted his resurrection. But second, Jesus' resurrection defied his disciples' doubts. And they didn't stay there. They moved past their doubts. And, and finally, Jesus' resurrection demands a response from us. Because we too are confronted with the claims of what Jesus has done. And so my title this morning is actually Doubting the Resurrection because I recognize and acknowledge that a lot of people in our community that when they hear these audacious claims of the gospel, they struggle to get their minds around them, struggle to believe that this could really be true. And so let's dig into our doubts this morning. If you are struggling, if you are wrestling with um, questions surrounding the resurrection and who Jesus is, what he's done. If you're questioning the reality of his presence here in this church, we, we want to dive right into that this morning here in Matthew um, chapter 28. And so, so if you're uh, if you're doubting, if you're struggling, uh, I want to let you know you're not the first person to doubt the resurrection. Jesus' disciples doubted. His resurrection. So as we as we look at Matthew chapter 28, Matthew's going to give us here an abbreviated account of Jesus' resurrection and post-resurrection appearance. Matthew was, if you don't know, a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, who walked with Jesus, spent three years with Jesus, saw Jesus rise from the dead. He was an eyewitness to Jesus' resurrection, and about 20 years later wrote down all of his thoughts and put it into the form of this gospel so that we could also encounter uh, the risen Christ through his words. And, and while there are a lot of things in the Bible about Jesus' resurrection, you know, Acts 1 tells us he spent 40 days meeting with various groups of people at one time, a group of 500 people at once. Matthew is going to zoom in really on three events here in Matthew 28. The first is this angelic visitation. The angel comes visits the tomb, and uh, he's going to roll away the stone, revealing it's empty. And he's going to announce that Jesus is risen from the dead. Matthew wants to call our attention to the angel's appearance. He wants to call our attention to Jesus' appearance, then to the women, which we just read about, Mary and the other Mary, as they're walking back from the tomb. And finally, Matthew wants to call our attention to Jesus' appearance to all the disciples together in Galilee before he ascended 
into heaven. But where we're going to start this morning is actually in verse 17. We, we get these claims of Jesus in Matthew 28, but I really want to start in verse 17 because I, I think it's an interesting text here that Matthew is going to include for us. I think it's an indication of the authenticity of his account that he's willing to include this little verse for us to, uh, to really engage with this morning. In verse 17, we read, and when they saw him, that's the disciples, Jesus' followers, they've been with him for three years, watched him and everything they've done, and the response here, when they saw him, the risen Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Isn't that an interesting response that Matthew is willing to include for us, right? These are not just a bunch of, you know, religious fanboys that are on the bus that are just like, yeah, Jesus is risen. No, no this is something that's going to radically challenge their worldview. Both of their responses in this text are very surprising. <laughs> Probably this has landed on you, right? As we're in Grand Rapids, you know, what one of my buddies likes to call Jerusalem, right? I mean, there's like more churches than homes, it sometimes feels like, around here. And you're like, man, it's just such a religious city. And so, of course, you know, everybody believes in Jesus. Everybody worships Jesus. Everyone's a Christian around here. And, and you need to really go back in time to get into the mindset of these Jewish disciples, these Hebrew Christians to understand that the fact that they're worshiping Jesus is actually a very shocking, very countercultural, very sort of crazy thing to be happening here, right? Because Jews were monotheists. And so, you know, the Shema is here, O Israel, the Lord is one. You know, there's one God. And so, so the fact that these disciples have turned around and started worshiping their, their Jewish rabbi should actually surprise us. It should, it should shock us that, that Jesus' disciples, good, faithful Jewish boys, have started worshiping Jesus, not just as their Messiah, but as God himself. I mean, worship for Jews was for God alone. And so for these disciples to be worshiping Jesus is a shocking thing. Just imagine if you walked across the street over there at Temple Emmanuel, and while they were celebrating their Passover together, if all of a sudden they all just started getting together worshiping Jesus, pulled out some guitars, and started singing some of the worship songs we're singing, it would be shocking. It would be a study. It would probably make the front page of the Grand Rapids Press, because Jews don't worship Jesus, right? That, that's just that's yet part of their religious mindset and makeup. And so something absolutely radical and life-altering and life-shaping had to happen for Jesus' disciples who have followed him and watched him all their lives to be now worshipers of the risen Christ. But equally surprising here is Matthew's admission that the disciples doubted. Don't you think, like, if I had been there, if I had saw Jesus rise from the dead, and appear to me, right? I mean, all doubt, gone. Like, I mean, problem solved, difficulties, challenges. I mean, I've seen it, right? I mean, that, that would pretty much pretty well settle your doubts. And we think 2,000 years later, wouldn't it be nice if Jesus could make a cameo this morning here on stage? And, you know, we could see if, without a doubt that he's here and he's alive. But, but what's interesting, what Matthew wants us to see is that even... Even here, even Jesus' disciples, even, even the guys that wanted this thing to be true, right? the ones that Jesus had told, I'm going to rise from the dead, they had gotten it in advance. They still couldn't wrap their minds around the reality that Jesus had really defeated death. Because if Jesus really did defeat death, if he's really coming back as Messiah and God, then it changes absolutely everything. And so some doubted, confronted with these audacious claims of the gospel, right? These disciples were a little more skeptical than maybe we'd give them credit for. Do you remember Thomas, the, the, the so-called doubting disciple? He said in John 20, 25, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my fingers into the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. And sometimes I think we're, we're tempted to believe that these disciples were, you know, they're kind of first century people. They're really into the superstitious and, you know, supernatural. And really pretty much anything can happen, right? I mean, these disciples. And, and, and that's simply 
not the case. A, a closer look at the time period in which Jesus' disciples lived showed that for both Jews and Greeks, Jesus' resurrection was utterly implausible. They didn't have any categories for it. Jesus' resurrection was absolutely revolutionary. And so, so let's look at, look, let's take a little bit of a closer look here at Hebrew culture. Right? We're, we're, not, we're not Jewish, most of us, and so we don't really get inside of that mindset and that culture. But, but if you want to understand Hebrew culture the way they thought about resurrection in the first century, we kind of need to go back and get a look at that to see just how revolutionary what we're talking about this morning is. The Jews did believe in in the resurrection. In fact, it was, it was the hope of God's people. If you read verses like Daniel 12, 2, um, it says that, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so they believed, right, that when you die, that wasn't it. Right? Those that are sleeping, they're going to come back to life. And, and Isaiah 65, 17 says that God is going to create, it says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. And so for those who have risen to new life, they're going to live in a new world, and everything's going to be made new. And, and that's the Jewish hope, right? That's, that's what they were longing for. That's what they were waiting for. So if you had told a Jewish person that Jesus rose from the dead, they would have said, You're crazy. Look around, right? We still have the same problems, the same difficulties, the same challenges. People still have cancer. People are still dying. You know, overseas there's still war. There's still poverty. There's still hunger. You know, the world has not been made new. How could you say that Jesus rose from the dead? How could you say the resurrection has come? Because nothing's changed, right? We're still here in the same old world, right? For the Jews, the resurrection in the middle of history was preposterous. They were waiting for the end of time, for everything to be made new. But you might say, well, it was just the Jews. Perhaps the disciples got their inspiration you know, from the broader culture. Maybe, maybe from the Greeks or from the Romans. Maybe, maybe their popular imagination inspired this whole myth of Jewish, of Jesus' resurrection. But actually, if you look at Greek and if we look at our Roman sources, actually the Greeks had no category for resurrection at all, period. Right in Greek pop culture, if you read Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey or the Aeneid or some of those ancient sources, um, you'd find that human beings, when they die, they become disembodied, witless spirits destined to roam Hades. And so, so death was the grim reaper in Greek culture. When you died, you went to Hades, the place of the dead, and that was it. And you know, anybody who claimed to come back from Hades was just, that was just wishful thinking. Like, nobody in the first century believed that. And in the first century, believe me, they were confronted with a lot more death than we are. Death was not something that they thought, you know, oh yeah, people rise from that all the time. No, they were faced with death every day. And just try to go to one of their hospitals <laughs> or, or go to one of them. I mean, it was, a, I mean, it was a horrific culture of death. People did not live the age that we live. People were confronted with death every day. And they knew very well when someone had risen from the dead or when they hadn't. If you consulted the philosophers like Plato, they kind of have the opposite view, actually. The death was actually freedom, right? You were released from this prison house of the body and the soul could go and be reunited with the cosmos and you know, kind of like more like a Buddhist or Eastern views, Hindu or something, where, where your ultimate destination is not to be in a body. Your ultimate destination is to be you know, reunited, nirvana, you know, and experience, you know, the cosmic, you know, oneness again. And so, if you ask the Greeks, you know, and told them, hey, Jesus just rose from the dead, they would have said, if they were a common, you know, Greek person, they would have said, that doesn't happen. Like, like people don't rise from the dead, people don't beat death. And if you ask one of the philosophers, they would have said, why would he want to come back? He's been freed from the prison of the body. He's finally able to join the spirit world. Why would he want to come back to a body? And so for both the Jews and the Greeks, right, Jesus' resurrection was, was even less plausible than it is for us. So if you're, if you're skeptical about the Bible's teaching that, that Jesus rose from the dead, you're, you're in good company. Right? People in the first century had, in many ways, more difficulty than we do. The question that each of us has to address is, is really, what are we going to do with our doubts? Will we settle for cynicism and agnosticism, or are we going to have the courage, like the disciples, to, to wrestle through our doubts and, and struggle with the reality that Jesus really rise from the dead? I, I met a guy at Carmery, or at Brewery of Vaughan, actually, 
just last week, who really enjoyed talking philosophy when he heard us talking, you know, about some of this stuff. He was really interested and very intrigued and, you know, wanted to talk about, does God exist? You know, wanted to get those big questions. Is there ultimate meaning, purpose, and destiny? You know, are, are there reasons we should really care, you know, about the suffering and the pain in the world? And, and he loved these discussions so great. I love asking the big questions. What was intriguing to me at the end of the day, he was totally happy to say, hey, you know, I'm really kind of undecided. You know, I like to hear a little bit of everything. You know, I really don't feel like I need to make up my mind about any of those things. And, and I'm just like, are you kidding me? Like, really? Like, like, we're talking the biggest questions. Does God exist or doesn't he? Like, you know, is there heaven, hell? And, you know, to just be agnostic your whole life and just say, ah, you know, whatever. Not a big deal. I mean, what happens to me when I die? Not really a big deal whether God exists or not. And I just want to challenge us this morning as we wrestle with the claims of the resurrection. Not to leave the big questions undiscovered. Not to stay in a state of agnosticism about the question, like, did Jesus really rise from the dead? But to wrestle through our doubts. Is that Jesus rose from the dead and it changes absolutely everything. So, so what caused the disciples to throw out their religious convictions, their common sense to worship Jesus? Why did Jesus' disciples and thousands of others radically alter their worldview historically and sociologically? How are we going to make sense of this? How can we account for the fact that they're willing to maintain their story of Jesus' resurrection to the point of death? You know, if you know anything about the first century history and the second century, all the great persecutions that happened to the church, you know, Christians being thrown to the lions, sawed in two, I mean, just horrendous persecution. How are they willing to hold on to this teaching about Jesus, and how did it entirely change the world? What explanation do we have for that? If you're just a secular person, you just said, you know, okay, I get Jesus was a person, you know, most historians will grant that you know, Jesus existed, that he was alive, and he, he died on his own cross, but what, ex what explanation do we have for this phenomenon of Christianity, the reality that Jesus <laughs> beat death, that animated this early church and moved them out into the world? As we return to Matthew's account of the resurrection here in Matthew 28, I, I want you to notice a couple of things here about Matthew's claims. Okay, I want you to notice, first of all, his attention to historical detail. Notice here as you're reading through the account, the attention to detail, right? The specific names, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. These, these are references, right? So people in the first century could go and talk to these people and interview them and say, did this really happen? Notice the specific times. Towards the dawn on the first day, these are not like kind of ambiguous, you know, sometimes, somewhere, Jesus rose from the dead. No, on the dawn of the third day after his public crucifixion, Jesus beat death. That's, that's the claim here. Notice the place. It's publicly specified. His tomb, it's a publicly recognized place, right? Guarded by a cohort of Roman guards who had sealed it and were standing guard over it. And so, so we've got these historical details that were all public record in the first century that people could go back and they could investigate the claim. Did this really actually happen, right? Matthew's claim is, is unambiguous there in verses 2 through 6 there. Is it right in verse 6? He's not here. He's risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, right? And if there was a corpse, right, it, Christianity pretty much loses all of its credibility. Christianity is based on historical claims, right? Like there are other religions, like you know, many of the Eastern religions are more philosophical, right? Whether Buddha lived or didn't live is not a significant you know, issue. It's his teaching that lives on, or Muhammad's teaching, or, or many other great prophets and teachers. But the claims of Christianity, right, they're rooted in this historical claim that Jesus publicly rose from the dead and the tomb was empty. And so as you move over in verse 11, we see that a public explanation is needed for this public resurrection. And so, you know, when the guards go and say, hey, this just happened. Jesus just rose from the dead. You know, the, we're going to see the religious authorities have got to come up with a plausible explanation. They need a press release to kind of spin the news here to talk about what's going on. And notice here in 15, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. And so, so Jesus' resurrection 20 years after the fact was still demanding an 
explanation, and people were still circulating a story that Jesus' body had been stolen to account for what really happened. There really was an empty tomb, and the explanation here is that Jesus' body was stolen. But what's interesting is you consider this, this explanation of the body stolen, you know, that in and of itself would be pretty, you know, conclusive, right? I mean, if Jesus, you know, nobody could find the body, right, and, and you know, nobody had ever seen this guy, um, then you pretty much would be pretty safe to conclude, you know, the disciples stole his body. But what we read in the New Testament and what animates the history of the early church is not only is Jesus' body not in the tomb, He's appearing to people all over Jerusalem for a period of 40 days, right? Corpses don't typically make public appearances, right? You know, it's said that he appeared to the disciples, to the women, which is actually a startling piece of information in the first century. Women in, the, in that time period weren't even allowed to testify at court. They didn't even have that level of credibility. And it speaks, again, to the authenticity of Matthew's account that he wants to make these women Right, eyewitnesses to the resurrection. This was just a cleverly invented tale. And the last thing in the world you'd want to do is include women in it because they had no credibility in the first century. Uh, but every detail of this account lends to the credibility of what Matthew is teaching about Jesus' resurrection. Not only do you have an empty tomb, you also have more than 500 eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection, right? And if, if, if there's an empty tomb, right? Where the empty tomb with no appearances, pretty much safe to say, okay, disciples stole the body. If there are appearances, but no empty tomb, they say, well, you know, people see loved ones all the time, they have visions and dreams. And, you know, but, but when you have those two powerful realities, an empty tomb, and Jesus making public appearances, and a church that is willing to hold that testimony to the point of death, you have a powerful and compelling reason to believe that Jesus actually defeated death. Something happened in history that still explains, demands an explanation, the growth, exponential growth of the church that we've been studying in the book of Acts. It demands an explanation. It demands that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Now, I want to give you a little challenge here. As I was sitting with, with our Theology on Tap kind of planning meeting, which is made up of a bunch of folks from around the community, uh, many of them not Christians, and, and, and talking about what we're doing. One of the guys um, was saying the group that he picks his church based on, on pretty much whether or not they believe his mom is going to hell or not. His mom is not a Christian, and so, so he's like, you know, pretty much he's like, you know, I just pick my church just by any church that thinks she's going to heaven, I'm going to go there. And, you know, it's like, okay, you know, people have lots of, you know, reservations against Christianity, right? Christians believe in hell, and we're in the city that has kind of low, you know, low winds, bumper stickers everywhere, and so, okay, so it, it, that's a pretty significant objection to Christianity, right? There are lots of others, right? Christianity teaches that God authorized genocide, well, I can't believe that. If Christianity believes Jesus is the only way, God can't believe that. If Christians aren't endorsing, you know, you know, to love is equal, I can't get behind that. Christianity is, you know, opposing science on any level, like, I can't get behind that. And, and what I want to challenge you, what I want to suggest to you this morning is that if Jesus really rose from the dead, we need to accept everything that he says, right? Even the things that challenge our opinions and preferences and values and things we hold very dearly. But if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, who cares? Right? Who cares what your opinion is on hell or heaven or Jesus rose from the dead or creation, evolution, you know, gay marriage, pick your hot button issue. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, who really cares, right? He's just another guy with his own opinions. You've got your opinions. i got my opinions. And, you know, let's just leave it at that. But if Jesus rose from the dead... And he's in a whole other category, right? He's not just another prophet and his teacher. He's Jesus, right? The Son of God, as we already sang earlier in this, uh, this service. And so some of you may be thinking, does it really matter that, it, that a Jewish rabbi just rose from the dead 2,000 years ago? Lots of paranormal things happen. And we, we, we like to watch Fringe. We like to watch lots of weird things if you're a little older. You like to watch The X Factor, you know. But not the X Factor. <laughs> wow, that's back to all other experience on the but, um, Yeah, wow. So, so anyways, there, there are a lot of people that would say in our postmodern culture, well, who cares if Jesus rose from the dead? Lots of strange things happen, but it really doesn't matter. 
You know, who cares if he rose from the dead? I mean, does it make any difference to my life? Does it make any difference to the real world in which we live that, you know, some Jewish rabbi guy kind of, you know, rose again? Like, who cares? Does it really make a difference? And, and this is where I want to suggest, right, that Jesus' resurrection, it, it demands a response from us. If the claims of the resurrection are true, which, which I hope this morning just opens up that conversation, I'd love to, if you're here, if you're doubting the resurrection, I, I'd love to grab your coffee over it or at Kava, or, you know, over at Roasters, and I'd love to talk through the resurrection. I, I don't consider, like, I have just toppled the entire row of dominoes of your doubt, and, you know, everything is all over here. I, I would love to sit down and walk through the evidence of the resurrection, but if Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead, there are some significant implications to that. And they're here for us in Matthew uh, chapter 28. I want to look at three of them. I'm going to close with these Three implications. If Jesus rose from the dead, this is this is what it means, and this is huge. Okay, I want to pick it up here in verse 18. And Jesus came to them and said, "All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me." Now, now if that isn't an audacious claim. I don't know what is. If I got up this morning and said, "Hey guys, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me," and so. Get to work here and do my bidding. I hope, you know, many of you would, like, run for the exit. Like, you would think, this is not a good place. You know, this is a, this is a cult. These people are going to be drinking the Kool-Aid. Like, I need to get out of here right away, okay? But, but when Jesus makes claims like that, we're either going to say he's crazy, right? Or, or he's serious, that he is truly making a claim. Not only to be a great teacher, not only to be a great prophet, but to be the very Son of God. When he says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, I mean, he's saying he's the king of the world, right? That, that's pretty shocking, right? That's pretty intense. Jesus is separating himself from all the other great teachers and him out there from, from Moses and Muhammad and Buddha and pick your favorite religious teacher right down to Oprah today or whoever your favorite guru is, Deepak Chopra. I mean, I mean, Jesus is separating himself from all of these great teachers and these gurus and the swamis and whatever your, your, your religious cup of tea happens to be. Jesus is claiming to be something altogether different, and that, that's what got him killed ultimately, right? Claims like this, that all authority on heaven and earth has been given to him. But what I want you to notice about this claim is that Jesus claimed that all authority in heaven and earth reveals that, that he's God and that he is reaffirming, reasserting his claim on this world. He hasn't given up on this world as, as broken and as, and as screwed up as it is and how jacked up our lives feel. Sometimes Jesus is reaffirming his commitment to the world. Right? He hasn't let go of the steering wheel. He is saying all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. So that I can make your lives new and ultimately so I can make this world new. Jesus' bodily resurrection affirms our bodies and it affirms the world that we live in. It, it demonstrates God's commitment to us to making, you know, not only some spiritual realities true somewhere out there, but Jesus' bodily resurrection speaks to hope for our bodies, for our real, physical, tangible world and Jesus' concern for it. N.T. Wright says it, says it so well that I'm going to quote it for you at length. And, and I hope this helps you to really grasp the implications of what Jesus is doing through this claim of asserting all authority on heaven and earth. Wright says this, the message of the resurrection is that this world matters. That the injustices and pains of this present world must now be addressed with the news that healing and justice and love have won. If Easter means Jesus Christ is only raised in a spiritual sense, this is crucial, but it's only about me and finding a new dimension in my personal spiritual life, which is so much of the self-help stuff out there. But if Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead, Christianity becomes good news for the whole world, news which warms more than our hearts precisely because it isn't just about warming hearts. Easter means that in a world where injustice Violence and degradation are endemic. God is not prepared to tolerate such things, and then we will work and plan with all the energy of God to implement the victory of Jesus over them all. 
You see, the resurrection demands a response right here in the real world. We're called to bring Jesus hope and Jesus' resurrection hope and healing to this broken and fallen world, to all the hurting and the suffering and the pain in the world. Jesus' resurrection demands that we take this world seriously. The evils, the injustices, the pain and the suffering called to bring Jesus hope. And so even if you're not a Christian here this morning, you're just kind of eavesdropping in on this sermon, you should want the resurrection to be true, right? Many, many people in our city who aren't Christians are deeply concerned for the social evils of our day. They want to see the end of world hunger. They want to see the end of, you know, you know, child sex trafficking. They want to see, you know, you know, our environment taken care of. They want to see the injustices and wrongs dealt with. The resurrection speaks hope into that situation. The world that seems to be off the tracks, off the rails, a world that seems to be just continually just full of pain and suffering. The resurrection speaks to a real hope for a real world and then for us to be engaged and to be involved. And so, so if you're not a Christian, you should, you should want the resurrection to be true. You may say it's all wishful thinking. You might say it's too good to be true. You, you, you might not be able to accept it, but at least you understand what Jesus is claiming. And not only is his resurrection some spiritual reality that might somehow impact your spiritual life somewhere on the pie in the sky, swim by and by, but, but that actually his resurrection is a claim that he's going to make each one of us, each one of the followers of Jesus new and ultimately make the world itself new. Second, Jesus tells his disciples to go and, and make more disciples. Isn't that interesting as you're following along in verse 19? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And this is where the claims of Jesus get very personal, don't they? Right? Jesus is not just asserting his authority over the world in some generic sense. He's asserting his authority over our lives. That's why he says, go and make disciples. Right? A disciple is a follower, a learner, a student of the great teacher, right? Someone who identifies with Jesus in their baptism. We're going to see a few baptisms later where people are going to identify with what Jesus has done. They're going to identify with his death and his resurrection, right? They're going to be buried with Christ in baptism, dead to their old way of life, risen to a new life in Jesus. They're going to radically identify with Jesus in his death and resurrection. They're going to affirm that Jesus is Lord, that and not only is all authority in heaven and earth given to him, but in all authority in heaven and earth over our lives as disciples. Uh, disciples are people, we saw in verse 20, that, that follow, that observe all that Jesus commands. Right? People that have submitted to their lives, to his rule and to his authority. Jesus is spreading his, his rule to the nations, right? Not, not from this top-down structure, not as a dictator who's going to command his rule through martial law. Jesus is going to spread his rule through people. Right? It's the ultimate grassroots movement. As, as people follow Jesus, they become disciples. They're raised to new life, right? They, they join what Jesus is doing in the world. It's, a, it's the ultimate grassroots movement. It's it's bottom up instead of top down. Jesus is changing lives, one life at a time, changing our city and changing our world through disciples wholly devoted to Jesus. Of course, this is going to be deeply challenging, right, to our autonomy, right? We want to do our own thing. We want to live our own thing. I mentioned last week C.S. Lewis. I've been reading through his autobiography, Surprised by Joy. Lewis, if you know anything about him, was a, he was a, he's an Englishman, but he was an atheist, turned Christian, and became one of the greatest apologists in the 20th century. And I love how Lewis said this about <laughs> his claims of discipleship. He said, remember, I always wanted, above all things, not to be interfered with. Right? That, that was as an atheist or as someone who, who did not follow the claims of Jesus. He's like, the thing I wanted most, most deeply was not to be interfered with, to, to do my own thing, to be master of my own fate and destiny. And discipleship is the ultimate interference, right? When Jesus loves us and he loves his world too much to leave us to our own best efforts. And Paul describes our, our best attempts, right, to live up 
to what God has called us to. He says that all have sinned and they've fallen short of the glory of God. We have, we have fallen tragically short of, of God's design for our lives in the world. And you just have to read kind of the headlines and the news to see how that has happened. And, and Jesus is calling each of us to personally take responsibility for our part in the world. And, and that's why Jesus came, right? The message of Good Friday, right? Jesus died so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be reconciled to God, brought into his family. And then and the, the message of Easter, which we're celebrating today, right? That we can join what Jesus is doing in the world. We can be his disciples, part of this movement here in Grand Rapids to bring his redemption, right? Right, to people that don't know Jesus, to the structures of injustice that are going on in the city, and ultimately bring this gospel out to the nations. Which brings us really to, to this last claim Jesus makes in verse 20, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Isn't that astonishing? Just imagine 2,000 years ago, Jesus standing there with his disciples who, who ate with him, drank with him, hung out with him for three years, saying, I'm going to be with you guys always. This may boggle your mind, but not only am I going to be with you always, I'm going to be with the church for 2,000 years. I'm going to be with the people. And so, so Jesus is here this morning, and, and the invitation is still here for you to join into a relationship with him. He's still alive. He's still moving. He's still active. He's still working and inviting people to be a part of what he's doing in the world. The resurrection demands a response. Right? We're called to repent of our rebellion, of our, of our running our own lives. We're called to receive Jesus' forgiveness, forgiveness and join Jesus in the restoration of all things. You can, of course, reject that rule, but you really can't have it both ways. You can't, you can't have Jesus' presence and, and power in your life and, and decide you're going to live life the way you want to. Jesus' resurrection calls each one of us to a response this morning. Are you going to follow Jesus? Are you going to commit your life to this life of discipleship and be a part of what Jesus is doing in the world? Or are you going to, are you going to be captain of your own faith, invent your own story, live your own life, do your own thing, which, which is the script that our culture is following. Be true to yourself. Find your inner beauty. Find your inner goddess, you know. And yet Jesus invites us to be free from all of that through his blood shed on our behalf through his death. We are invited in, welcomed in, to a family. So if there's no condemnation for us, for our rebellion, for our rejection of him as the Messiah, we get welcomed in to enter into his community and to partake of his resurrection life and of his power and his presence moving among us. Let's pray as we're wrapping up here. Father, we, we just want to acknowledge that you're here. You're in this room, and, and what I've said isn't the last word, Father. It's what you're doing in our hearts and in our lives and our community and our city. And, and God, what happens here this morning, God, um, we pray you do immeasurably more than you could ask. But we realize that what happens here isn't an end-all, be-all, God. And you have called us to be your sent people in the city and bring this resurrection hope out there to our neighborhoods and to the brokenness and to the injustice and the, the poverty and, and the sickness and to the dark places of the city. And so we pray that you come fill up your church with your resurrection power to be your people in your city. We pray this all in Jesus' name.